Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Join us as we continue the story of Lady Law by Ken Farmer. Chapter 13 Boulder Mountain Well, wonder what he's telling them, asked Bill. Eh, he's showing them now he's the leader of the chief. See how the others avoid eye contact? Just like a pack of wolves. When a new leader comes into dominance, the others look away in acceptance, making eye contact with any wild critters a form of challenge. Well... This bunch is definitely wild and vicious, added Fiona. The three worked their way back down from the crest far enough to stand. Now, what's your plans now, children? Fiona tilted her head to the north. We take the lookout first. I'd say you got it well in hand. Old Pike's gonna get on about his business. Don't forget what I said. Take him out any way you can. They is without honor. He turned and headed back down to where Lulabel was hobbled. Interesting man, commented Bill. More to him than meets the eye, added Fiona as she watched him disappear around some boulders at the bottom of the mountain. How do you want to do it? asked Bill. Best way I know how. Head on. Roberts nodded. Ah, my favorite too. I'd say on foot. The boys would make too much noise. No need in letting them know we're coming that far ahead. Agreed, Marshal. Shall we? Fiona nodded toward a point in the trail between the lookout and the renegade's camp. When they reached the reference point, Bill and Fiona headed to the left toward the lookout's hiding place. The Indian's focus was back up the trail, and he wasn't aware of their presence until he heard a voice from behind him. I'd turn around real slow if I were you, said Fiona softly. Her peacemakers were still in her holsters. The Apache froze and then turned his Winchester in his hands. Drop it, said Bill, fifteen feet to Fiona's right. He had his thunderer pointed at the Indian. The Apache glanced his way and then back to her. Uh, You be, I guess, Teskina, she-devil. She grinned. Good a name as any. You're Apache, I take it. He nodded. Kadar, mean powerful in our language. He slapped his chest with his left hand. No surrender to Pendalikawi. He spat on the ground. Your choice, she said. Kadar rapidly levered around into the chamber as he raised the rifle to his shoulder. His finger never tightened before Fiona's pistol roared and a thirty-eight forty ball from her right-hand pistol thudded into his chest. He looked down at the hole just as the blood started trickling out. The renegade screamed the Apache war cry, took one step toward her when a slug from her left peacemaker impacted his forehead. His head snapped back. He staggered against the boulder and collapsed like a sack of wet grain, dead before he hit the ground. Damn, woman, you drew and fired before I could squeeze my trigger, and my finger was on it, said Bill as he shook his head. I think you're getting faster. I wasn't thinking about it. You were. Thinking slows you down. I'll remember that. I expect they know we're coming now. I expect so. The Cherokee and the other three remaining renegades looked in the direction of the two shots as they echoed and reverberated up and down the canyon. Ah, she come. Is good. He hand-motioned the Comanche and the two Kiowa to different places to fire from. He took a position beside one of the support boulders for the cave. 
Nakoma climbed almost fifty feet above the creek, while Kuruk and Whitehorse positioned themselves closer to the trail entrance to the campsite, one on each side. They waited. Bill and Fiona split up and took opposite sides of the trail, working their way through the boulders, part way up the sides of the canyon. Nakoma saw Fiona creeping in his direction. He was above her and not in her line of sight. He eased the lever down and back up on his Henry, quietly chambering around. She cautiously slipped around the shiffer robe sized rock, flattened her back against it, and peeked around the side. The Comanche snapped off a shot when he saw her white face momentarily appear not thirty feet away. His forty-four forty round ricocheted from the granite and whined off down the canyon with a mournful sound. Fiona jerked back after being showered with glass-like rock fragments and sharp splinters. One piece cut a gash over her left eye and another small one embedded down on her jawline. Both bled freely. She grabbed the kerchief from her neck and quickly tied it around her head and over the eye to keep the blood from running down into her eye. I know where you are now, she mumbled when she saw the cloud of black powder smoke. She stepped out from the rock, snapped off four quick rounds. Two from her left and two from her right pistols at the boulder directly behind where the Indian had shot from, and then ducked back to cover. Fiona was rewarded with a scream of pain from the shooter as he fell from his hide and tumbled down the mountainside. The Indian lodged limply against a small gnarled juniper beside the trail. More than one way to use a ricochet. She flipped open the gate, ejected the spent shells, and replaced them with four rounds from her belt. Fiona watched the body for any movement for a couple of beat. There was none. Not breathing and not man-killer. Three more. Come out. Come out wherever you are, she said to no one in particular. Bill crept up on top of a large boulder and looked over the edge at one of the Kiowas, White Horse. The Indian carefully watched the back trail and then was distracted by the gunfire. Bill took that as a cue, scrunched his hat down, drew his buoy, and launched his body at the renegade below. At only a hundred and fifty pounds, Roberts was not a big man, but hurtling down eight feet through the air created a force that took the larger Indian from his feet, momentarily stunning him. White Horse staggered erect while Bill bounced up, sweeping a leg under the Kiowa and sending him down again. Roberts dove on top, buried his knife up to the hilt in the man's chest, and held it there until his last spasm. He raised up from the dead Indian and whistled sharply once. That makes two. Fiona worked her way forward until she was no more than fifty feet from the wide open area in front of the cave. She tried to make out Bill's position across the trail and finally saw the top of his gray Homburg on the other side of a boulder. At the same time, she heard the pounding of horses' hooves and then the splashing as they entered the water. She stepped from her cover to see two Indians on horseback sloshing in the middle of the creek, sending white spray high into the air, and then disappearing around the far bend through the narrows. One of them was unquestionably Cal Mankiller. Damn it to hell! Across the trail, Bill raised up and saw them disappear also. He made his way over to her position. And our horses are a half a mile back there. Might as well be a hundred, she answered. Bill looked at the blood on her face, pulled out a clean handkerchief, and handed it to her. You get hit? Just rock splinters. Ricochet. She dabbed at the small cut on her chin. Ow! I think a piece is still in there. Fiona tilted her head up for him to take a look. He leaned in, took the kerchief from her hand, and cleaned the rest of the blood away. Yep. He took out his small pocket knife, unfolded the long master blade, flicked the sharp piece of granite loose, and removed it with a cloth. Here you go. Bill handed it to her. Thanks, but I don't want it. Don't keep souvenirs. Right. He shook the splinter free from the handkerchief and then handed it back to her. Still bleeding. Hold this on there till we get to the horses. 
Got a styptic stick in my shaving kit. I'll check that one under your headband there. They turned and headed back up the trail. Might as well fix a bite of lunch and boil up some coffee before we set out after them. Fiona said after Bill cleaned the larger wound above her eye. He stopped the bleeding and gave her a clean bandana to wrap around her head. Should be able to find their sign after we go through that narrow canyon. Be like shooting turtles in a barrel if they caught us coming through there. Ah, good thinking. Let them settle down and think we're not on their tail. Maybe they'll think we got wounded in the exchange with the others. She nodded. Wonder where old Pike got off to. Figured he'd come back after the shooting stop. I no telling. He's an odd one, all right. After their coffee and cold corn dodgers, they tightened their cinches and rode back down to the camp area until they ran out of trail. They apparently checked the depth of the creek well before we got here, said Bill as they were splashing through the water. He nervously scanned the tall cliffs above their head. Good rock bottom, too. It was an ideal place to camp. They rounded the last bend and came to the conjunction of Panther Creek from the north and West Cache Creek. The combined creek flowed in the direction of Fort Sill. They waded their mounts out of the water on the east side. Well, don't think they would go south. That goes to the fort, said Fiona as she cut for sign to the north along the bank. Here we go. She reined Spot to a halt and studied the tracks that came out of the water. No question. Man-killer's horse. They're headed north. Bill took out his map and studied the area for a moment and then looked over at Fiona. Anadarko? She sighed past the mule until he was next to Robert's tippy and looked over at the map, too. Fort Sill to the south, nothing but prairie to the east until the nations, then back to Elk Mountain to the west and eighty miles to Cloud Chief to the northwest. Anadarko? Less than thirty miles to the northeast. Fiona paused for a moment and thought. To quote Arthur Conan Doyle's great detective Sherlock Holmes, when you have eliminated all which is impossible, then whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. I think Bass would say, Anadarko. She glanced off to the south. Well, looks like a cavalry patrol coming our way. Must have heard the gunfire. Ah, the echoes travel a long way in Hard Rock Mountains. Bill looked over at the ten-man patrol as the officer to the left of the right guide held up a gauntleted hand. Detail! Halt! The officer nudged his mount forward. Good afternoon. I'm Captain Bryan. Please state your business here, said the handsome thirty-three-year-old soldier. Captain, I'm Deputy U.S. Marshal Bill Robert. He pulled his coat back to show his badge. And this is Deputy U.S. Marshal F.M. Miller. She held up her badge from her pouch. He noticed the blood on the bandana around her head and the fresh scab on her chin. Do you require medical assistance, ma'am? They're just scratches, and I'm fine. Now we're tracking some renegade Indians. We had a skirmish back down in the canyon there. Bill indicated behind them. Two of them got away. We'll take over from here, Marshal. If they're the renegades we've had reports on, it's our job to capture them and take them back to the reservation. I'm afraid not, Captain. His deep blue eyes snapped over to Fiona. I beg your pardon, ma'am. One, it's not ma'am. It's Marshal or Fiona. And two, we have jurisdiction. These particular renegades have committed multiple felonies over in the nations and we've tracked them here. You may, if you so choose, recover the bodies behind us. Three may be found a little over a half a mile back up Cache Creek. That's called the Narrows, Marshal. An apt description, Captain. Marshal Roberts and I killed two there. The third was a result of an argument between two of the Indians over leadership, and the fourth is the half-day's ride to the north, just this side of Medicine Creek. He was dispatched by Marshal Roberts yesterday. She pulled out the warrant from her pouch. We're tracking the last two. 
This is the warrant from the Ninth Judicial District Court in Fort Smith, Arkansas, on one Calvin Mankiller, a full-blood Cherokee. He's wanted for multiple counts of murder, arson, rape, larceny of horses, and kidnapping. The other Indian with him is Apache, or possibly Kiowa, we believe. The officer took the paper, scanned it, and handed it back. Ah, appears to be an order, ma'am. Um, Marshal, is there anything we can do to help? I would be happy to split the patrol, send half on body detail, and I could bring the other half and assist you and Marshal Roberts. Not necessary, Captain Bryan. No offense intended, but we work better alone, if you know what I mean. There are only two of them, and we believe them to be heading to Anadarko. Ah, uh, yes, ma uh, I mean, Marshal, it's kind of difficult to keep a cavalry patrol quiet. He grinned as he appraised Fiona's unique attractiveness. Exactly, but we appreciate the offer. She flashed a big smile at the officer as her steel-gray eyes twinkled. He blushed slightly, looked away momentarily, and then touched the brim of his olive-drab slouch hat with the crossed sabers on the front and nodded. Detail! Left wheel! At the trot! Ho! The unit splashed forward into the water by twos behind the captain and the right guide and headed up the canyon. The sun was setting as Fiona and Bill trotted along to the north. The newly acquired pack horse from the Potawatomi had almost completely recovered and was easily keeping up with Tippy and Spot. I do believe that Captain Bryan was smitten, Bill said with a grin. Oh, I think he was just being polite. <laughs> he chuckled. Not likely. You really think so? Uh-huh. It's another ten miles or so to Anadarko. What say we camp over there by Tonkawa Creek? Commented Bill. I'm for that. Don't know about you, but I'm a bit worn. Ah, so am I. Climbing up and down mountains can do that to a body. They rained down into the creek bottom and found an open area surrounded by trees. After pulling their tack and letting them drink their fill, they picketed the animals on some good graze. Bill built a fire pit while Fiona was over behind some cedars, changing from her buckskins to her traveling clothes. She stepped out, pulling her sheepskin coat on against the cold north wind that had sprung up. Hope we don't get hit by sleet again she commented. Bill turned, stood up from adding some larger deadfall limbs he had broken up to the growing fire and looked to the north. I don't think so. No cloud bank. Feels like just a dry norther. Well, whatever. That wind can cut right through you. I noticed, he said as he pulled out his sheepskin coat from his carpet bag, slipped it on and wrapped a thick green wool scarf around his neck. If you'll start the coffee and supper, I'll go gather enough driftwood and deadfall to last the night. Deal. And Bill dropped his third armful of wood near the fire pit. He grabbed his cup and, using one of his black leather gloves as a hot pad, picked up the pot and filled it with Fiona's hot, stout trail brew. Ready? I am. Everything is on and should be ready in fifteen or twenty minutes. She held out her cup. He filled it and set the pot back on a flat rock next to the fire. Saw what looked to be a campfire a couple of miles or so to the north while I was gathering wood. Think it was them? I guess. Want to try to slip up to their camp? Bill shook his head. Ah, no way we can sneak up on them in this country. Flat as a pancake between them and us. Nothing else. Their horses would hear ours coming and alert them. Rather, that didn't happen. Don't intend on letting them get set. Yep. Notice that about you. Bill sat down on a large log he had pulled up next to the fire. Heat feels good. Glad we're down here in the bottom. They can't see the glow, and dry wood doesn't smoke much, he sniffed. Stew smells good, too. She grinned. 
It's amazing what you can make with jerky, potatoes, wild onions, some spices, and a little creativity. The morning dawned cold and clear. A thin layer of ice crystals had formed along the edge of the bank. Fiona filled the coffee pot and walked back to the fire as Bill was adding some more sticks and bigger branches to the coals. The dry wood almost instantly burst into flame. Fiona opened the bag of ground coffee, added two handfuls to the water, and set the blue speckled granite ware pot on the rock at the edge of the fire. She sliced some salt pork into one skillet and poured some cornmeal and flour mush in dollops into the hot grease and another for fry bread. Bill held his hands out to the flames and rubbed them together. He had led the boys downstream to drink and then took them back to their picket area and slipped the nose bags on each with a bait of grain. Ah, we probably should lunge the guys around a bit after putting the saddles on. Expect they'll have a hump in their backs this morning. Fiona grinned and nodded her head. That's probably a capital idea, Marshal Roberts. This is not the kind of morning I would choose to get bucked off. Actually, I wouldn't want to get bucked off any time, if you know what I mean. I do, Marshal Miller, I do indeed. Back in my younger and dumber days, when I worked for Mr. Chisholm, that's what my job was. Bustin' brought. I can really tell it on mornings like this. Take a while after I get up to get everything working. I could tell. She laughed and started forking the fry bread out of the skillet and onto a plate next to the thick slices of salt pork. Come and get it, Mr. Roberts. He raked some of the bread and pork into his tin plate. Ah, now if we just had some fresh buttermilk to go with this sumptuous meal. You'll have to settle for trail coffee, sir. It'll do, my lady, it'll do. He held out his cup for a refill. Tippy and Spot had been lunged, brushed, and saddled before Bill and Fiona mounted. It was a good idea to warm them up. I got to thinking, how would I feel if somebody jumped on my back first thing on a cold morning, commented Bill. Spot seems to be very comfortable and smooth, but he's always smooth. He just glides, never seen a natural single foot like his. I can agree to that. Betting jump, too. Jump? Fiona asked as they headed out to the north at a jog trot. Yeah, in New Mexico they have contests for jumping mules. They're especially good at a standing jump. You know, what we would call a flatfoot jump? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. I guess I'll have to show you sometime. How far do you think that fire you saw last night was? Bill rubbed the back of his neck. Ah, uh, hard to tell at night. Depends on how big it was. If it was the engines, they don't build any bigger fire than they need to cook their dinner, so might have been two or three miles. That's what I thought. She pulled her forty-five seventy Winchester from its boot, checked the chamber for a round, uncocked the hammer, and laid it across her thighs. You think they're still there? asked Bill. Probably not. Never known man killer to keep the camp much past daybreak. Just like to be prepared. Remember when he shot your hat off down by the red? He shucked his Winchester, too. I do, I do indeed. Be a good idea to scan ahead with your spyglass, too. Right as usual. He reached back into his saddlebags and fished out the nine-inch three-stage glass. Where did you come by that, anyway? Looks like a good one. I met a mariner once. Did him a favor, and he gave it to me. I think he said it was a nine-power glass extended all the way out. Nine-power? That means uh, things look nine times closer than they really are. I know what it means. I've just never heard of a spyglass that powerful. A seven? Yes. He handed it across to her. Give a look. Fiona pulled all three sections out, making the tube a little over twenty inches long, and put the small end up to her right eye. Ow! What's the matter? My eyebrow is still a bit sore from that cut. She held it up again and panned across the horizon ahead. Oh, my! That's wonderful! 
See anything? Just a coyote cutting out of a plum thicket and chasing a cottontail through buffalo grass. A male coyote. You could tell that through the glass? No, I was just funning you. He shook his head and held out his hand. Give me that. I might have known. You do the tracking. I'll scout. She grinned. Let's check that coulee over there that runs down to the creek. I'd say it's between two or three miles from our campsite. Ah, uh, looks like a good spot to start. Fiona's mule turned one of his long ears back toward Bill. <laughs> she laughed. I think he thought you were talking to him. Smart mule. I could have told you that. They pulled rain at the edge of a shallow draw. Aha. Uh -huh. Ashes. They're not even trying to hide their track. Either they're overconfident or they're waiting for us to follow them. Follow them? Confrontation time. I think he's tired of running and wants to get his revenge for me shooting him. He's trying to make it on his terms. That's not going to happen. Two miles closer to Anadarko, Fiona was first to notice a spiral of smoke ahead and to the east over a slight rise. Smoke? That's too big to be a campfire. I think it's a house or barn fire, commented Bill. Oh, no. She nudged Spot into a gallop. Bill urged Tippy and the pack horse to keep up. They topped the low hill to see a small white board and bat house fully engulfed in flames. There were three bodies in the yard scattered between the house and a small shed. She dismounted from Spot before he was completely stopped and ran to the smallest body that was nearest the house. It was a young girl about three years old in a faded calico dress. Her throat was cut and she had been scalped. Fiona slumped to her knees as her body shook with sobs. Damn him! Damn him! Damn him! She whispered through gritted teeth and her tears while gently closing the sightless eyes with her fingertips. Bill dismounted, checked the woman, and then the man closer to the shed. Both were dead, shot and scalped. The farmer was unarmed. Bill walked over to Fiona and helped the crying woman to her feet. He held her against his chest. Let it go, Fiona. Let it go. Why is God doing this? Why? 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 It's not God. This is Lucifer's doings. That Cherokee is the messenger and personification of evil, the arch enemy of all humankind. She leaned back, tears streaming down her face. Then I am God's sword of justice, and I will see him cast into the lake of fire. They buried the family near an apple tree at the side of the ashes of their home. Fiona took her King James Bible from her saddlebags and read over the graves. To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. She closed her small leather-bound Bible and held it close to her breast. With tears still streaming down her face, she looked heavenward. Take these innocent souls, Lord, and hold them to thy bosom. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, added Bill. We'll have the undertaker from Anadarko come out and erect markers. Surely someone in town will know this family's name. Let's hope so. Fiona stopped and looked at the ground before she mounted Spot. There are two more sets of tracks that join Mankiller and the other renegade. Looks like reinforcement. Chapter 14 Anadarko, Oklahoma Territory 
They pull rain in front of the red-skin livery at the end of Main Street, and Dab Muffleshaw, the elderly proprietor, stepped out, his cheek bulging with his customary wad of tobacco. He let go a long stream of the obnoxious brown fluid in the dirt. Well, looky here, looky here, it's Marshals Miller and Roberts. Back from your trip to the mountains, I see. Where's your palouse? A dark cloud came over Fiona's face. One of those renegades shot him out from under me. Damnation! Sorry to hear that. He was a fine animal. He was. Did you get the scoundrel what done it? Marshal Roberts did. And Dab spat another stream in the dirt, splattering some of his worn Jefferson boondockers. Now, he wiped the dribble on his chin with the sleeve of his once white boiled shirt, lifted his battered old gray fedora, and cleaned the inside band with a grimy blue kerchief, and then put it back on his balding head. Seen two of that original bunch come into town a couple hours ago. There's two more with them. I ain't seen a four. Took em to be Apache. Tied their horses in front of Big Dog Saloon, they did. They looked down the street and saw four animals standing hip-shot at the hitching rails. The dried lather on their shoulders glistened in the sun. There were six additional horses tied on the other side. I need to get em outside, Marshal, said Bill. Looks like Lesh is getting a crowd in there. Too dangerous. Some citizens are going to get hurt. You're right. I don't see Mankiller coming peaceable or any of the others, most likely. I suspect the reason he recruited some help is he's ready for a confrontation. Fiona set her jaw. But he wants the numbers in his favor. Yeah, well, he's got that. It's four to me and you. Guess he doesn't realize how much trouble he's in. Fiona noticed a teenage boy in faded bib overalls over a tattered pullover long sleeve shirt inside the livery, cleaning stalls. Who's the young man you have working in there, Dab? Oh, that's a local boy, Willie McPhee. The school marm lets him out after lunch so's he can come down here and work for me. Family needs the money if, uh, you know what I mean. She smiled. Oh, I do, I do indeed. Call him out here, would you please? He nodded and turned to the open doorway. Willie, put your rake down and come out here for a minute. The red-headed lad looked up, leaned his rake against the stall, and shuffled out to the front. He jerked his battered melon hat from his head and held it in front of him, nervously twisting it in his hands. Yes, sir? Willie, this here's Marshals Miller and Roberts. How do? Did I do something wrong? His apprehension was obvious as he nodded at the two law officers. Fiona took a short pencil and a small spiral notebook from her inside coat pocket, opened it, and jotted down something on the first page. She ripped it out and folded it over. No, nothing like that, Willie. We need you to take this note into Mr. Lish down at the saloon. If you can do that, I've got two silver dollars for you. Golly gee, Marshal, that's more than I make in a week. He grinned from ear to ear and his eyes lit up. Can you do it? Yes, am I sure can. He jammed his hat back on his head as she handed him the note. Now, you tell Big Dog that Marshals Miller and Roberts give you this note and he's to read it to some Indians inside. Understand? He'll know who. He nodded. Then... You ski-daddle on out of there. Don't dawdle. All right? Yes, am I'm more than pleased to take care of this for you. Mr. Lish is my friend. He lets me sweep up every Sunday morning for church. Place can get pretty tore up on Saturday nights, you know? Oh, I can imagine. Now, Scoot. Willie took off at a dead run toward the sandbar saloon at the opposite end of the street. Hope he does what I told him and gets right on out of there. I don't trust Mankiller as far as I can throw him. Here tell he's a real miscreant and an evil doer, commented Dab. Ah, that doesn't even start telling it with him. Willie slipped in the saloon by crawling under the bat wing doors instead of pushing through them. 
He quickly walked over to the end of the bar nearest the door. Kiwat Lish, serving a cowboy at the opposite end, noticed the young man motioning. He strolled over to him and pretended to wipe the top of the bar. Now, what can I help you with, Willie? You look a little out of breath. Yes, sir. I ran all the way from down to the livery. Got a message for you. He handed him the note. This is from Marshalls Miller and Roberts. The lady law said to tell you this was from them and to read the note to some engine. He looked around the saloon and noticed the four renegades against the far wall drinking beer. Said you'd know who and then for me to get. I understand, Willie. Now you hightail it. Go, go. He whispered and nodded toward the door. Yes, sir. He turned and scooted back under the door and took off running back down the street to the livery. Lish unfolded the note and looked up at the four Indians across the room. He reached down under the bar and brought up his sawed-off double-barrel Remington shotgun and laid it on top. Man Keller, got a message for you. The big man raised his voice so the renegades could hear, but so could everybody else in the saloon. The Cherokee's gaze moved to the bartender. What? He replied with no small degree of irritation. There's two marshals down the street. One of them is a lady. Says you call her against the skinna. She devil. The other is Pendelicoe. Sent you a note. Black Fox, whose Cherokee name should be as give tis due, or frightened rabbit, brings much shame upon his people killer of women and children, doesn't have the courage to meet she-devil outside. He should bring his cowardly Apache friends for help. We wait. He laid his hand on top of the deadly tin gauge. His action was noted by man-killer. Uh, and only does not fear any woman. He kill, he said as he got to his feet. The Cherokee motioned to the other three at the table. They also rose. He leaned over and whispered in Kuruk's ear. The Apache nodded and grabbed his Winchester leaning against the wall, turned and headed down the hallway to the back deck that extended out over the Washita River. Kuruk pushed open the screen door at the back, walked to the west end of the deck, and climbed up a wooden ladder built against the side of the building to the roof. He crawled on top, slipped over, and knelt down behind the four-foot-high false front that extended above the roof. The Apache levered around into the chamber of his rifle and peeked up over the top of the facade. From his vantage point, he could see the entire length of the street. He waited. Willie ran back up to the marshals and Dab. They had stepped just inside the aisleway of the livery. I done just like you said, Marshal Miller. She reached in her coat pocket and pulled out three shiny Morgan silver dollars and handed two of them to the teenager. Thank you, young man. Now, here's another. If you'll stall our stock, give them a good brushing and a bait of your best grain. She gave him the third dollar. You stay inside here, no matter what. You hear me? Yes, am he stared at the three ounces of silver in the palm of his hand. I spend the whole night in here if you wants me to. Fiona patted his shoulder. I really don't think that will be necessary, Willie, but thank you. Uh-huh. Thank you, Marshal. He grinned as he led Spot and the two horses toward their stalls. Just a minute, Willie. The young man stopped and turned. Yes, am I need to get something. She stepped over to Spot and pulled her eighty-six forty-five seventy long barrel Winchester from its boot. Now you can go ahead. She headed back to Bill and Dab. Two to one man is putting one of the Indians on the roof of the saloon as we speak. He'll spread out the other two on each side of the street. Then the treacherous bastard will claim he wants to meet me one on one. Marshals, if you don't mind, I'd like to help. She and Bill both shook their heads. Too dangerous, Dab. We appreciate it, though. I don't mean to brag, but I made a living shooting buffler back in the day. Learned to trade being a sharpshooter for the Confederates with a four fifty one Whitworth. She was accurate up to six hundred yards. 
Fiona and Bill exchanged glances. Dab looked out the big double doors of the livery and pointed. I could get a top Gibson's dry goods across the street. Good view of the saloon from there. Ain't but two hundred yards. Hell, I can pretty near spit that fur. <laughs> Fiona grinned and handed him a rifle. All right. I know this isn't a Whitworth, but it'll hold seven rounds. Shouldn't have to reload. If it has only one engine on top of the sandbar, won't need but one round. Bring you six back. He spat into the loose straw in the aisleway. I'll slip out the back and circle around west and go in the rear of Gibson's. Percy's got an inside ladder to the roof for patching leaks and such. Uh, we'll wait till we see you way from the top before we head out. Now, if Man Killer did put somebody up there, he'll wait till we're about fifty feet or so from the saloon. Then he'll raise up, take his shot, thinking he's got us dead to rights, so to speak, said Bill. <laughs> It'll be the last thing that red hide'll ever do. Old Dab'll cut him loose from his pockets. Man Killer waited until he heard Kuruk on the roof. Uh, Taza go across street to water trough down in front of store that sell food. Delche, stay on this side. Go to alley one block before livery. Hide other side of barrels. Wait till law dogs pass. You be behind. Uh, men killer wait in the street. We kill like a hussy. And Dab settled in on Gibson's roof, checked down the street, and briefly saw the top of the Apache's head above the facade. The renegade wasn't looking his way yet. He waved at Bill, watching from inside the alleyway. He and Fiona stepped out into the street, but then they split up. Bill got on the boardwalk on the north side and Fiona on the south. Both stayed in the shadow of the canopies. <laughs> Dab chuckled. Yep, never do what they expect. He looked down at his target above the saloon. The Apache had poked his head up three times like a turkey and then ducked back down. Del Shea got to his feet from behind the trash barrels in the alley, stepped out a couple of steps, and pulled the hammer back on his Henry. He took a bead on Fiona's back after she passed. A shot rang out, followed by the thud of a bullet striking flesh. Another shot discharged into the dirt of the alleyway as the Apache's finger spasmed on his trigger. He collapsed and fell forward, mortally wounded with a hole in the middle of his chest from Bill's thunderer from across the street. Taza looked up from his hiding place behind the water trough and saw Delche fall. He turned to fire at the source of the smoke on his side of the street and took a bullet through his rib from one of Fiona's thirty-eight forties. He staggered forward and Bill put a round in the middle of his forehead. Mankiller was confused. He stood in the middle of the street, looking first at the gun smoke on one side and then on the other. He saw both Apaches fall, but couldn't see either of the marshals in the shadows. Sweat began to bead on his upper lip as his soulless black eyes flicked about. Fiona replaced the spent round in her pistol and holstered it. As if on cue, she and Bill stepped out into the street walking slowly toward the Cherokee. Behind the false front above the sandbar, Kuruk saw his chance, raised up and aimed down into the street. A large chunk of wood was torn from the top of the facade to the left of his face. The Apache jerked his shot in reaction and the bullet meant for Fiona caught Bill in the thigh. Kuruk's head exploded into a massive cloud of pink mist as the second boom of the big boar 4570 echoed up and down the street. He collapsed to his knees, fell over the facade, tumbled to the top of the porch canopy, and then rolled off into the street. His body landed ten feet to Mankiller's right. You hit, Bill? she asked. Only in the leg, he replied. Too far from the heart. Fiona continued her inexorable march toward the Cherokee. She finally stopped thirty feet in front of him. 
She had removed her black morning coat down at the livery and was down to her red paisley bustier over a white blouse with mutton sleeves and her dark gray split riding skirt. Her deputy United States Marshal's badge was pinned on the left side just below the top of the bustier. Her ivory grips twin peacemakers she carried in a black concho-studded cross-draw belt and holsters shone in the sunshine. Mankiller shook from both anger and confusion. Do you want to turn yourself in, Calvin Mankiller? She said softly. Uh, Cherokee die first, he hissed. Suits me. Um, but take Agustaskina with him. Fiona grinned. Not likely. His left hand flicked, and in the blink of an eye, his ten-inch bone-handled buoy buried itself in her left shoulder. It struck below her clavicle with a loud thump. He had hidden the deadly weapon in his hand, folded up behind his arm. The Cherokee reached for his revolver. Fiona staggered back one step, simultaneously palmed her right-hand peacemaker. It roared as she shot Mankiller in the arm before he could clear leather with his Remington pistol. He yelled in pain, grabbed his upper arm with his off hand, and dropped the gun in the street. The Indian tried to reach down and pick it up. She took a step forward, cocked her pistol again, and shot him in the left kneecap. He screamed and dropped to that knee. That was for the history family in Pickens County. Her pistol roared again as she shot his right ear off. He screamed once more and tried to grab the bleeding side of his head. That was for the butlers and their two children you killed and scalped, you worthless scum. Fiona cocked her pistol again and shot his left foot. That's for the Farquhars and their three-year-old daughter whose throat you cut and then you scalped. The air around her was permeated with the sulfuric smell and haze of black powder smoke. She shot his right kneecap. He collapsed to the dirt and raised up on his elbow. That was for the four people you killed at Ashland and Tubby's Mercantile, including a seven-year-old girl, she said through gritted teeth. No, Asgis Teskina, stop! How many of your victims asked and pleaded for you to stop? How many? Tell me, you evil bastard. She shot his left ear off, holstered that peacemaker, reached over and drew the other, and cocked it. Her left arm hung uselessly at her side. That was for the Hancocks in Cook County that you gutted in front of their children. He held up his right hand. Tears of pain were rolling down his brown face. Stop! Stop! Man killer, surrender! She shot him through that hand. That's for my friend Faye Skeens that you kidnapped and raped. Fiona cocked her pistol again. This time she gut shot him. And that's for the family and a scalp three-year-old blonde-headed child we buried right outside of town this morning. Tears were running down her cheek. Mankiller lifted his face from the dirt and held up his bloody hand again. Please! All right, if you insist. This is for my husband. Welcome to your first day in hell, she hissed. Fiona shot him between the eyes and holstered her peacemaker as Mankiller flopped over on his back. His left heel drummed briefly in the dirt and then was still. Bill hobbled up beside her and was quickly joined by a wide-eyed dab. My God in heaven, Fiona, I thought you were going to bring him to justice. I just did. Her eyes rolled back up into her head and she collapsed to the street. Get a doctor, Bill yelled. Big Dog had come out of his saloon and watched her ceremoniously dispatch Mankiller. Don't have one. He turned as he heard hooves pounding from down the street. Look, here comes Captain Bryan and his cavalry patrol. He'll have a doctor with him. Detail, hold. He held up his hand and quickly assessed the situation. 
Medical officer, front and center. He dismounted and handed his reins to the right guide. A U.S. Army major in the second rank behind the captain dismounted, unbuckled his medical kit from behind the cantle of the McClellan saddle, rushed forward, and removed his gauntlets. He knelt beside Fiona and felt her pulse. We've got to get this woman inside somewhere. That knife has to come out. Plus, she's in shock. Corporal Smith and Tyree, Privates Barber and Riggler, front and center with a blanket on the double. Place Marshal Miller in the center. Be particular with her now. And carry her, ordered the captain. Where, Mr. Leash? Ah, uh, this way, man. I have an empty bedroom in the back. It's mine, said Big Dog. He led the four troopers carrying Fiona into the saloon and to his room in the back. The doctor noted Bill's blood-soaked pant leg as he hobbled toward the bat-wing doors of the saloon. It appears you are in need of medical attention also, Marshal. Ah, it'll keep. Tend to her first. I'm Major George Wolford. Take this strap and wrap it around above the wound as a tourniquet. It doesn't appear that the bullet hit your artery, and with you walking, it didn't hit the femur either. He handed Bill a one-inch-wide woven canvas strap with a brass buckle from his bag. Ah, no, sir. I guess if it had, I'd already be dead. That's probably true, Marshal. Roberts. Brushy Bill Roberts. Just sit down inside and prop that leg up, Marshal Roberts. I'll take care of it later. All right, if I have a drink. Can't see how that could hurt at this stage. Might help deaden the pain. He motioned to the two remaining troopers as they were finishing tying the patrol's mounts to the hitching rails. Give this man a hand, gentlemen. Yes, sir. The two soldiers responded. Bill draped his arms over each man's shoulders, and they proceeded into the saloon. Thirty minutes later, the major came out of Lish's bedroom, drying his hands on a clean towel. He had removed his blouse, rolled up the sleeves to his dark blue center button shirt, and opened his collar. "'How's Fiona?' asked Bill. "'She's going to be fine. No major damage. And she's out of danger from shock now. Her scapula prevented the knife from going all the way through, so only had one wound to disinfect and sew up. She'll be pretty sore for a few weeks. Glad she didn't wake up until I finished the stitches. Don't have any ether with me.' He looked down at Robert's blood-soaked pant leg again. "'Sorry, Marshal.' Gonna have to cut your trousers to get to that wound. Ah, that's fine, Major. They're already torn in a few places from crawling over your mountains down south. Plus the bullet hole. He tried to chuckle, but the increasing pain wouldn't let him. The doctor took out his scissors, split Bill's pants from knee to hip. Big dog, I need some more hot water for the good marshal here. Yeah, coming right up, Doc, said Lish. Here, Marshal. Drink this. I've got to dig that bullet out. Bill looked at the dark green bottle. Laudanum? It is. Two big swallows, if you would. Wonderful. Hate this stuff. Beats the alternative. It does that. I've been there a few times. Actually have some twenty-five bullet and knife scars at last count. Well, guess I'll have twenty-six when you're finished. He took two swallows of the bitter cocaine lace painkiller and wrinkled his face. Great stars, man. How'd you get all that many? Bill shook his head and grinned. I've been on both sides of this bed since I was about seventeen. <laughs> Gotta learn to duck more. Kiwat Lish set a pan of hot water on the table. Anything else, Doc? Yes. Need to pull a couple of these tables together so I can stretch Marshal Roberts out. Easier to work on his leg. Dab, you want to give me a hand? Sure, big dog. The two men pulled the tables together. Lish got a cloth from under the bar and covered them. Then he and Dab helped Roberts up and laid him down across the tops. Be back in a moment with a pillow, Marshal. I would appreciate it, dog. Bill smiled a lopsided grin. Looks like my patient is about ready, said the doctor. Thirty minutes later, the doctor finished tying off a clean white bandage around a semi-conscious Bill Roberts' thigh. I had no idea there were that many verses to Lily of the West, Major Williford said with a grin. A bloody pair of forceps and a forty-four forty slug lay in a washpan on a table behind him. Bill looked up 
His eyes were still a little dilated. Are you done yet, Doc? I am, Marshal. Yeah, damn good thing. Felt like you were grubbing for potatoes in there. Mr. Muffleshaw went across the street to get you a set of crutches from the mercantile. He sat up on one elbow. Who? Deb. Deb Muffleshaw. Oh, hell. Why didn't you just say so? He laid back down on the table. I think I need another shot of your sour mash there, Mr. Leash. Keewat looked at the doctor. He nodded. I think I'll have one, too. Is that all right with you, Captain? Well, let's say you're officially off-duty, Doctor. Actually, let's say we're all officially off-duty. Ah, uh, drinks are on the house, then, announced Big Dog. Dab came back in the front door with a set of brand-new crutches and leaned them against the tables Bill was lying on. He sat up, grabbed the crutches, and balanced on one leg until he got them under each arm. Whew! Glad to get off that table. It's worse than sleeping on the ground. Gotta go check on Fiona. Bill worked his way toward Keewat Lish's room where she was and eased the door open. And Dab, Captain Bryan, the doctor, and Big Dog followed him inside. She was propped up in the bed on some pillows and looked over as the group entered. Well, I know this isn't awake, so it must be the welcome back committee. Ah, she lives, said Bill. He glanced over and saw Mankiller's knife on the bedstand. I thought you didn't keep souvenirs. She glanced at the big knife, too. Decided to make an exception. Gonna hang it on my wall. If I ever get one. A hell of a knife, Bill commented. Damn lucky, I'd say. Fiona looked down at the bandages in her left arm in a new white cotton sling and then up at Bill and his bandages. I see you've also been the recipient of the good Dr. Williford's ministrations. I have. Bill swung the crutches aside, sat down in a bow chair next to the bed, and held out his hand to dab for his shot glass of whiskey. Thank you, sir. If that's sour mash, where's mine? inquired Fiona. Yeah, coming right up, Marshal, said Lish as he left the room. She looked over at Dab. One shot, huh, Mr. Muffleshaw? I heard two from my Winchester. Dab looked down at the floor. Ah, sorry, Marshal, she shoots a tad to the left. First shot told me that. He grinned. I put the second one in this melon. He reached into his pocket and pulled out some of the big rounds. Here's five back. She smiled. Good enough. I'll get them later. Sights must have gotten knocked off when my sweet Diablo went down. You're forgiven. Oh, yeah, and I took them renegade's horses and tack down to the livery. You won't believe what I found in one set of the saddlebags. The corners of Fiona's eyes turned down. Scalps. Stinking to high heaven. Bury them, if you would. Three of them, including the one that would be blonde with ring curls, belongs to the family just outside of town. Dab nodded. Ah, the Patterson family. Little girl was named Catherine. I'll see that the undertaker gets them. I'm going to sell the horses and tack and have him bury them proper in caskets and all. They were friends of mine. His voice broke slightly. Thank you, Fiona whispered to him. Lish came back with a glass of whiskey in one hand and the bottle in the other. Your sour mash, Marshal. I brought the bottle in case anybody needs a refill. She held the glass up with her good right hand. Here's to the elimination of another scourge of the West in a nation that becomes too civilized to administer equal and exact justice to evil, barbarians will rule. Ah, uh, that's another quote I don't recognize, Miss Miller. Who said that one? asked Bill. Fiona looked at him with a wry grin. Whose lips were moving when you heard it, Marshal Roberts? Epilogue Sandbar Saloon and Adarko, Oklahoma Territory. 
Fiona and Bill sat at a table near the bar having snifters of a special liquor with Captain Bryan. Roberts had his crutches propped against a nearby chair. "'Excellent brandy, Keywat,' said Bryan. Uh, "'Just a little something I keep in the back for special people, except it's not really brandy.' "'What is it?' "'This is called Quavassier V.S., Captain, a brand of cognac made in France. It was a favorite of Napoleon,' said Fiona. "'Unbelievably smooth,' commented Bill. "'What does the V.S. stand for?' "'Very special.' replied Lish. And very special it is, too. Never had anything quite like it. I'm afraid you may have spoiled me, Kiwat, said the captain. He glanced over at Fiona with her white cotton sling. How's that shoulder, Marshal? Her steel-gray eyes looked at the tall cavalry officer from under the brim of her hat. Sore, but Dr. Williford did a nice job stitching it up. Just glad we can ride the train back to Gainesville. Don't think horseback, or in my case, muleback, would do it a lot of good. Ah, Captain, I've heard there's some trouble brewing down in Cuba. I'm considering coming down to Fort Sill and enlisting soon as my leg heals up. Interesting you bring that up, Bill. President McKinley has called for 1,250 cavalry volunteers to assist in the war efforts. Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt, has been pushing for American involvement in the Cuban War of Independence since it started. It just so happens that Fort Sill is one of the recruitment stations for the 2nd Cavalry Brigade. Bill, this is the first I've heard of this. He ducked his head and grinned. Oh, well, you know me, Fiona. I haven't been in one place more than two years since I left New Mexico in 81. He glanced over at Brian. I've always admired the cavalry, Captain. Call me Jim, for now. Of course, after you enlist, it will be, sir. Ha, 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 Roberts laughed. Ah, sounds good to me. Your name is Jim, short for James? That's what my mama said. Of course, she only called me James, with my middle name, when I was in trouble. She smiled. What is your middle name? Reese. James Reese Bryan. I can still hear her. James Reese, you get out of there. I'll take a peach switch to your bohunkus. <laughs> and the funny thing, she didn't even have to see me to know what I was doing. Mothers are like that. Her eyes twinkled. He raised his glass in a toast. The mothers everywhere. They each took a sip of the Quavassier. Well, here's to the United States Cavalry, said Bill, holding his glass up. Here, here, said Brian. They each took another sip. May have to keep thinking of things to toast. I've got several more bottles, Captain, commented Lish. Brian turned to Fiona. I took it on myself to wire your friend in Gainesville, Town Marshal Walt Durbin, to bring him up to date on you, Bill, and Mankiller. He told me there was a $2,000 reward on the Cherokee now. It would be waiting for you when you get back. She glanced at Bill. I want to tell him to give it to the Hancock children there in Cook County. That all right with you, Bill? Uh, absolutely. Don't think I'll be needing it anyway. Well, I'm considering resigning my commission. Uh, do what? Bill almost shouted. Why? One, I took care of the main reason I became a marshal in the first place, and two, I feel like I pushed the ethics envelope when I took him down. But in my heart, I felt like just hanging wasn't enough punishment for all the inhuman atrocities he committed. I wanted him to suffer like he made his victims suffer. Yeah, and not counting the fact that Judge Parker's no longer around to see justice done, I can't help but remember one of his expressions the preacher used at his funeral. It is not the severity of the punishment that is the deterrent, but the certainty of it. No telling what philosophy the new judge is going to have. What do you think you'll do? Asked Bill. I've developed some pretty good skills, and bounty hunters don't have to answer to anyone. I'm sure there are others out there in the same category as Mankiller, 
murderers, rapists, pedophiles. I would go after the worst. They always have dead or alive conditions to their bounty. Bill nodded. Ah, uh, yeah, a lot more profitable, too. I just didn't think I could handle it if somehow that beast got off. Roberts grinned slightly. I think you took care of that situation quite well, but I understand what you're saying. You know, I'm still amazed you and Bill took out that entire gang of renegades. Wish we could have participated. They were some of the baddest of the bad. Oh, believe me, you're preaching to the choir, Jim. I had been after that Cherokee for three years. Thought I killed him once. I was making sure this time. I'm just glad we had some help from Dab in taking them out here in town. Chances are that Apache could have shot us both from that rooftop. I wouldn't mind having him watch my back any time. As a great shot once he got zeroed in. <laughs> Bill chuckled. But the biggest problem was locating them. She took a sip of her cognac. Without Pike, we might still be hunting them. Lish looked up from drying a shot glass. Who did you say, Marshal? Fiona looked over at the big bartender. We met an old white-haired prospector in buckskins. Knew the mountains like the back of his hand. Actually, we found him by accident, or he found us, when we took shelter in his cave. He came in the back way with his burrow, Lulabelle. Quirky old fellow. Led us right to where the renegades were camping. Uh, what was his name? Big Dog cautiously asked again. He was Scottish. Said his name was Padraig McPherson, but they called him Pike when he was in the English Navy. Said it stuck. <clears throat> Lish cleared his throat. Uh, Marshal, don't really know how to tell you this, but old Pike McPherson's been dead for now to fifty years. What? That can't be, exclaimed Bill. We ate with him. He drank our coffee and smoked one of my Virginia cigars. Said he preferred Cuban, though. Well, I have to tell you, you're not the first that's seen him. Tell me, did he talk about Andrew Jackson? Well, yeah, several times, said Bill. Jackson was president when Pike was roaming the Wichitas. Did you uh, happen to find any Spanish coins? Fiona pulled out the two gold doubloons from her coat pocket and laid them on the bar. Lish and the captain both leaned over to look at them. It means he wants you to come back. You're telling us that we spent more than twenty hours with a ghost? I don't know, Marshal. I'll ask you one more question. Where was the cave where you encountered him? On the south side of Elk Mountain. He said it was an old Spanish dig and went all the way through the mountain. It's where we went to get out of the storm. Big Dog shook his head. Uh, there is no cave in Elk Mountain. Not anymore. They say it collapsed in 1846 during an earthquake, buried Pike and his donkey. Nobody knows where it even was anymore. Bill and Fiona exchanged glances. She picked up the coins. And these? Well, the story goes he found the lost Spanish treasure, but never showed anybody where it was. May have to check that out one day. He pointed to where it was when we found these. I do hope you'll look me up when you come back, Marshal. And I do hope you'll quit calling me Marshal. How about Fiona? He gave her a big smile. Make you a deal. You call me Jim, and I'll call you Fiona. And to repeat... I do hope you'll look me up when you come back, Fiona. I think you can count on it, Jim. And of course there's nothing to prohibit you from coming down to Texas on your next furlough, is there? She gave him an equally big smile, too. The captain looked out the bat-wing doors for a moment and then back to Fiona. There is one thing you should know. And? I have a daughter. She's nine. Her mother died in childbirth, and she goes with me wherever my duty post is. Fiona put her hand on his arm. I'm so sorry you lost your wife. I guess that's something we have in common. What's your daughter's name? Ruth Ann. He smiled as he thought about her. She's my life. I think you'll like her. 
if she's anything like her father. I'm sure I will. Can't wait to meet her. They clink, interlock their arms, and sip their courvoisier. The end. You've been listening to Lady Law, written by Ken Farmer, narrated by Ken Farmer, copyright 2016 by Ken Farmer, and production copyright 2016 by Timber Creek Press. This concludes the story of Lady Law by Ken Farmer, read by Ken Farmer. We hope you have enjoyed this story. You can find many more books by Ken on Amazon, available for Kindle and in paperback. This story has been brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please hit the subscribe button and leave us a comment if you've enjoyed this story. Till next time, happy trails.